Ladies and gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us in this discussion of tradition. We're on video 14, and we're on week three of the um, fundamental theology course of the Catholic Distance University. And by the way, you may be watching this and not be in the Catholic Distance University course that I'm teaching this and using this video for. You're welcome to, to see and learn what some of our students are seeing and learning. And you're also invited to inquire Catholic Distance University, cdu.edu, great material, great opportunities for learning, whether you want to study graduate level, undergraduate level, or just personal enrichment level, uh, community education, continuing education. We have it all, and I invite you to check out what we have. Now, let's go to this important message uh, on tradition. Why is it important? Because now we're going to talk about authoritative teaching of the Second Vatican Council. It's in the lifetime of some of us, like me, but uh, it's very, very, it's the most recent ecumenical council. It's very authoritative. And the Vatican Council II documents had a very big, big impact, of course, on the catechism. So the teaching of Vatican II on tradition is developed a little bit further, even in the catechism in some ways. All right. So let me just say that before this uh, great event happened in 1962 to 1965, we have the great theological renewal revival that went on really from, I would say, let's say, you know, late 30s all the way through to the time of the council. There's a great explosion of Catholic biblical scholarship and of theological scholarship. And one of the great works that came from Eve Congar during this period was a book. And the title of the book has had a huge impact on Catholic culture. And the name of the book is Tradition, with a capital T, and Traditions, with a small t. And Congar is trying to reflect on the whole history of tradition and traditions in Catholic theology. Does an awesome job. Great book. Highly recommend it if you have some extra time. But anyway, let me just share with you. He leans very heavily in the end of the book as he finishes up his dis discussion of a history of tradition, of Blondell. And he um, fundamentally makes all this teaching very accessible to the bishops, many of whom read this book before they come to the council. So it's a very important book, um, and the council fathers leaned on it quite heavily. All right, and, and just you know, keep in mind, when the pope makes some, a, a priest a cardinal, it's basically saying, look at this guy's teaching, everybody. We owe him a great debt. And probably the greatest debt we owe Congar is his teaching on tradition. All right, so the content of tradition, you find this in Dei Verbum, um, paragraph 7, Dei Verbum, of course, Constitution, Dogmatic Constitution on Divine Revelation, Vatican II. You also find excerpts of this in The Christian Faith by Norner Dupuy, the collection of doctrinal documents. Okay, so here you see that the council is aware and want to teach that Tradition does not just contain explicit stuff like the rosary practices and, and uh, teachings and, and, and things like customs. It involves that tacit dimension, the implicit. Where do you see that? Okay. Let's, the apostles handed on what they received, whether from the lips of Christ, from his way of life and his works. And that's observation, not words. You know, that's tacit dimension of life. Or whether they had learned it at the prompting of the Holy Spirit. And that would be, you know, insights acquired after the resurrection. Jesus promised, I'll send you the counselor. He'll show you all things. So, you know, this is part of the idea also why we talk about um, Revelation closing at the, with the death of the last apostle. Okay, but the point here I'm making here is, that they intended, if you read the commentaries on this line here by Ratzinger, you, you, they intended to include this tacit dimension that Blondell and Congar help us to see and the importance of it. It's global. It's a very global thing, tradition. It involves, quote, everything that serves to make the people of God live their lives in holiness and increase their faith. Okay. It includes doctrine, life, and worship, all right? And I try to make a point, if you took the Catholic theological tradition, that you can see from the very beginning that doctrine, explicit doctrine, arises 
from life and from worship and liturgy. It's, it's, it's there, it's embedded, it's implicit. We're, we're living it and praying it, and then we reflect on it. A lot of times because of a heretic denying certain things, we have to reflect on it, and we, the church makes it explicit, and a lot of times it defines it solemnly. But first, before it's ever made a solemn dogma, it's part of our life, and it's carried on in life. And this is why, just make this point, uh, I think it was Pius XI said, that the liturgy is the ordinary vehicle of the magisterium of the Catholic Church. That would also include the ordinary vehicle of tradition, or at least one of the big vehicles of tradition and how it reaches us, how that river comes into our lives, okay? Its riches, this is Vatican II again, quote, its riches are poured out in the practice and life of the church, in her belief and in her prayer. Okay. It's the first time in the history of the magisterium that this teaching on the nature of tradition, and it's leaning very heavily now, uh, not on the either or of the extreme modernists versus the traditionalists, but in the both and of guys like Blondel and of Congar. Okay, it includes all that the church is. Now, the church is a mystery. <laughs> so, and all the church believes what the church believes in are mysteries. So there's, there's a content to, to, that is supernatural to Catholic tradition, tradition with a capital T, using Congar's distinction, okay? The reality of the risen Christ present and acting among his people through his spirit. It also gives, gives us the idea that tradition grows as it moves away from its source and connects to us. It's bringing us the riches of the nations also without using that passage from origin in, in this document, but it, the idea is still there. So let's talk about the catechism. The catechism goes a little bit beyond by using the title of Congar's book. The Vatican II itself, in De Verbum, doesn't make the distinction between tradition with a capital T and tradition with, traditions with a small t. But the catechism does. So the catechism, you know, written uh, a few decades after Vatican II, uh, actually explicitly shows the hand that we're, we're using Congar very heavily here in this teaching of Congar. Okay, so there's various theological, disciplinary, liturgical, devotional traditions, lowercase t. They can be witnesses or embodiments of tradition with a capital T. Okay? Universal Catholic tradition with a capital T, um, that's, that's mag the magnificent reality of the whole shoot and match. But just keep in mind, traditions with a small t are time conditioned, every single one of them are. Just like every statement of the magisterium, every book of the Bible, they're time conditioned or they're historically conditioned. So you have to try to understand them in their context. All right, so I'm just gonna make this point. What's time conditioned? What's universal Catholic tradition in the liturgy? Everywhere you go in all the liturgical rites, east and west, you find liturgy of the word and then the liturgy of the Eucharist. You'll find a very clear insistence on a realistic interpretation of the Eucharist. This is really Christ's body and blood. Okay. Now, the word transubstantiation, we don't see that until the 13th, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, yeah, late 12th, early 13th century. And that is a function of the philosophy of Aristotle. And if you understand it right, you've got to kind of understand what substance and accident mean in Aristotle. Most people today don't know that. Um, and the Easterners never picked that up. They never use it. So the word itself, transubstantiation, is a later dogmatic tradition specific to the Western Church. But the real presence of the Eucharist, that is universal going back to the beginning. That's part of tradition with a capital T, okay? We in the Western Church typically think about kneeling as a sign of adoration. And you can find kneeling in the early church and you can find it in the Old Testament. But kneeling primarily is a sign of penitence in the early days of the church. In fact, the Council of Nicaea forbids anyone from kneeling during Easter time. So to this day, the Orthodox who follow that canon, 
You know, that canon is a disciplinary canon. It's not universally binding for all time or anything like that. The creed is universally binding for all time, but not disciplinary sorts of things. We'll see this later. But discipline cannot be a matter of something irreformable, okay, or something that can't be changed. So discipline is not part of the infallible teaching authority of the church. Anyway, uh, to this day, Eastern Orthodox will solemnly close Easter, Vespers on Pentecost, by kneeling. Okay, now, Germanic tribes came into the church uh, in the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages, you know, um, the Franks and others came in. They, the Franks were the first to become Catholic. But they brought in customs that weren't part of the Greco-Roman world, like kneeling becomes a sign of honor or homage to a lord. So that's how kneeling becomes a very important part of the Western liturgy. It never became an important part of the Eastern liturgies. So to this day, you can go, and the Eastern liturgies are awesome in their reverence for God. But they express reverence through a solemn bow to the floor, and they stand throughout the liturgy. So, you know, you just need to understand our customs are beautiful in the West, but we can't see them in the same way as the sign of the cross, for example, that goes back to the beginning. We can't, we can't make them, you know, universally binding. We have to understand their time condition, okay? So um, th these are just a few ideas. Uh, also, just mentioned the posture of prayer in the early church and in the Bible is hands raised, okay? That's why our priest raises hands, because he's presiding in prayer, and in the early days, anybody who prayed would have their hands raised. So the priest is the president of the assembly. He's offering prayers for all of us. His hands are in the orans position, but that was the normal prayer position. Where did the folded hands come in? Again, Germanic influence. The German uh, tribes during feudalism would express their fealty or loyalty to their Lord by putting their hands like this inside of the Lord's hands that would be like this. And that was a pledge of fealty or loyalty. So that's how this kind of prayer posture gets into the Western tradition. You don't find this in the Eastern traditions of the Catholic Church or the Orthodox churches. So it's just, just a little you know, idea of how there are time-conditioned things that enrich the, the church's culture. But we can't absolutize them. We just have to understand that they're historically conditioned. Uh, they're beautiful. They're valuable. They're, be they're great. Okay. Now, what is tradition with a capital T? Well, interestingly enough, this can go all the way back to the 5th century. We see St. Vincent of Lorraine, a monastery on a little island off the coast of southern France. And he said in a book that he wrote that had a lot to do with issues like tradition and dogma, development of doctrine even, he says that tradition is that which is held ubique, semper et abomnibus. And that means tradition, you can locate tradition with a capital T by looking for what is everywhere, always, and by everyone held. Okay? And if you took Catholic theological tradition, we said none of the fathers individually are infallible. And in fact, all of them have their own little quirks and idiosyncrasies, just like anybody else. And they also, most of them, make errors here and there in their writings, uh, with the exception maybe of Gregory of Nazianzen. Uh, you know, that's one guy who, who never fell into anything that was later defined as heresy, <laughs> all right? But th where are the fathers authoritative? In their consensus, the consensus patrum. Why? Because that shows you if they all hold this thing, like they do, in fact, the divinity of Christ, or they do, in fact, the Eucharist in a realistic interpretation as the center of life, as really the body and blood of the Lord, okay? That's universal. So that's tradition with a capital T. That goes back to the apostles and to Christ himself. All right, so that's very, very important. Now, here's something that we need to make clear. Various traditions with a small t in the plural can be retained, modified, or even abandoned in light of tradition, capital T, guided by the magisterium. Now, what's an example of this? Okay, early bishops wore no headgear. Miters, you know, we're used to a miter on our bishops. We don't see evidence of that in writing and in art until about the ninth century. So all the early fathers of the church who were bishops and popes are all depicted in their day, if we have icons of them that go back that far, they all are bareheaded. Later on, 
medievals will do art and Renaissance people and they'll put miters on everybody because bishops in their day had miters. But the Pope certainly didn't wear a tiara. A tiara is a crown, it's a miter that becomes a crown. Now why did he wear the crown? It's because he was the king of central Italy. The Frankish tribes conquered some nasty Germanic tribe in the north of Italy called the Lombards and they gave some of the Lombards land to the Pope. And it was called the donation of Pepin. Pepin was the, the, the Frankish ruler of the time. And so the Pope became the ruler of all of central Italy. And, you know, in the Middle Ages, bishops were seen as nobility. So bishops are called princes of the church, you know, because, you know, the nobility were princes and they live very lavishly. The Pope lives very lavishly, has a crown, has an army. Okay. Now, Paul VI, after the Second Vatican Council, decides to give away both of the papal tiaras. Now, why did he do that? Well, in a democratic age, where the, the emphasis of the church needs to be uh, on humble service, on the Pope as the servant of the servants of God. That title goes back to St. Gregory the Great. So, uh, the church is the poor are in need. So, what's he do? He donates these to the poor. And you can see one at the Shrine of the Immaculate Conception in Washington, D.C., and you can make a donation. There's a money box there to give to the poor. I don't know where the other one is, but that's where one of them is. Um, and that's where I went to school. So I saw it many times as I went into the Shrine of the Immaculate Conception in the crypt down below, by the way. So the papal tiara, the Pope judged that we need to let go of the papal tiara. And, you know, um, clerical garb in general has changed over time. You know, and there are many today who are trying to revive clerical garb from the 1950s. Okay, well, the, the, uh, that, you know, whether you like it or not, the, the idea is that some things don't fit anymore and don't speak well, and then maybe they get in the way more than they help. Maybe they helped once. Maybe the tiara was legitimate when the Pope was a king. But no, he's not a king now. He, his lands have been reduced to the tiny little papal state, and he certainly doesn't want to come across as a, one of the kings of the earth. There's not that many left, you know? So anyway, um, I'm just making a point that certain traditions can be abandoned or modified or critiqued by the, mag the tradition itself and, the, and by, by the Pope and, and the magisterium, okay? So I just want to point out that in De Verbum, the problem of the critique of tradition, of purifying tradition, of, of changing traditional practices, that's not developed very much. And keep in mind, no magisterial document is complete and has the last word. The Catechism of the Catholic Church is fantastic, beautiful document, but it's, it's very weak in certain areas. It doesn't speak enough about, in my view, as a theologian looking at the tradition, for example, uh, the gifts of the Holy Spirit as explained by St. Thomas. That, it doesn't talk about the charisms of the Holy Spirit. There's an affirmation that charisms are given in every age, but how do we understand the charisms of tongues and prophecy and other hum more humble charisms like um, hospitality? Okay, it's not developed in the catechism. Well, the catechism is really thick. It can't do everything, you know? It does a lot. So this is true of conciliar documents. They don't do everything. Trent didn't give us anything about the nature of tradition. It just reaffirmed that it's an important norm, traditions. Okay, Vatican II now makes some progress. Catechism makes a little progress by giving us the difference between tradition and traditions. So there's more progress to be made. Okay, so there's a beautiful quote I'm not going to read, but it's a magnificent quote by John Paul II from Orientale Lumen, the light from the East, writing on the contribution of the Eastern Church. It's a beautiful compendium, really, of all we're talking about here. You can see in his beautiful uh, kind of tribute to tradition that goes on for a good long paragraph, you can see all that we've talked about so far laying behind the Pope's teaching. Beautiful. Now, last thing I want to talk about really, um, well, second to the last thing, is development of doctrine. Okay? Actually, it's the third to the last thing. The development of doctrine. Um, just keep in mind, we're not going to do a lot. We could read John Henry Newman on the development of doctrine. He was a great master and taught about it in the 19th century. Uh, but we don't have time to really delve into this wonderful topic. But suffice it to say that in De Verbum, we see the basis 
for development of doctrine. Number one, there's a growth in insight into the realities that are being passed on, the words and the realities passed on by tradition. There's growth in insight. There has to be growth in insight. We can never know it all. The content of the word of God, including tradition, is mystery. So we're always going to be getting new insights. That's the main source of development of doctrine. But also, we, we just have to keep in mind, there's historical conditionedness of past statements. Okay? They came out of a context, and the context has changed now. And therefore, uh, there needs to be a restatement. And this is a great thing that Paul, uh, John the 23rd said at the opening speech of Vatican II Council. Um, and many of you have read this. And if you haven't, I highly recommend you read the speech. But what he said is that sacred doctrine is one thing, and the way that it's, that it's expressed is entirely another. So this council is not going to change sacred doctrine, but we're going to re-express it so it's more understandable to people living today in the modern age. Okay? That's development. Anytime you, you, you translate doctrine into a new circumstance, there's development going on. There's change that's going on, but not change in stable content of the, of the truth, change in our understanding and way of expressing it. Okay. Now, I just want to say something about development of doctrine. Sometimes development of doctrine is like constant increase, completely continuous, one thing leading to another, to another, to another. That's probably easy for us to understand, you know? But we also have to just note the fact that sometimes development of doctrine is jagged, okay? Sometimes the church loses some of its grasp on a certain truth and rediscovers it later and, in, and, and increases it later. What's an example of this? Well, capital punishment. If you read the New Testament, um, you see mercy. Jesus, capital punishment by law was due to the woman caught in adultery. And Jesus said, no. <laughs> what he, but he said it creatively. I'll let you, whoever is without sin here, you cast the first stone. And that left her with him because he's without sin. And, she, and he said, go sin no more. So he, he commands her to change her life, but he doesn't carry out the sentence of capital punishment on her. So now there's, there needs, there's, in the early church, there's a great reticence to being involved in the shedding of blood. Many left the service of the army. Many refused to kill in the early church. So we have a lot of soldier saints and soldier martyrs um, in, in the early church like Sebastian, et cetera, et cetera. Um, people who, if you read Hippolytus, he makes clear that a lot of people, by their profession, they cannot become baptized unless they change their profession because there's idolatry, and there's death involved, okay? So anyway, there's a great reticence um, to be involved at all in blessing, killing. Um, and then what happens? The, the church and the state, the state becomes the protector of the church and the state is brutal. You know, the Germanic tribes, when they were baptized, they didn't change their attitude about murder. Neither did the Romans, by the, by the way. They stopped the gladiatorial games, but they still did some pretty nasty stuff in war. The Christian Roman ki kings. And quite frankly, um, in the very earliest of days, they got critiqued pretty heavy sometimes by bishops. Ambrose critiqued Theodosius the Great, who went and massacred, in retribution, he massacred everybody in a, in a stadium, in a chariot stadium, because they had rioted the week earlier and somebody had killed his mayor. So the next week, when the games were going to happen, the races, he, he just killed everybody. And he was, had to do public penance for that. Okay? Unfortunately, as time went on, it became a certain comfort in capital punishment and in war. And even Vatican, uh, the Pope, as king of central Italy, uh, regularly executed criminals. Okay, so we lost a little bit of our early reticence. Now, by the same token, there's a teaching that the state has the right to use deadly force to protect the state. So someone who is a threat to the state who can't be contained otherwise, the state has the right, if, especially if that person has forfeited their right to life in a certain way by taking the, an innocent human life, the state can... Um, use deadly force to stop that person. But once that person is incarcerated, um, should the state kill that person? Well, that's been a development of doctrine where John Paul II, who himself was attacked and forgave his murderer, he speaks with great authority and great, uh, really, credibility and says, in the modern world, modern state, it's almost impossible for it to be needed 
for a state to carry out capital punishment. You know, there still is a just war theory, but I'll just tell you, you know, the just war theory, we lost a lot of the, the grasp of that um, o over many years when, you know, there's bishops and popes blessing armies going to battle who are not following just war criteria. So here's my point. You know, we can get clearer on things. Another is a religious liberty. It's another, early church, it was a, a dictum you find in lots of the fathers. God does not work by compulsion, but rather by persuasion. But you end up finding out in Middle Ages, you know, states are putting people to death and the church is blessing this for heresy. Okay. Now, nowadays, you know, that's a, unfortunately a great blot on, the, on the, the life of the church. John Paul II has asked publicly for forgiveness for the church's involvement in that sort of thing, that kind of religious persecution. So in Vatican II, um, we see clear teaching on religious liberty. And that's really recovering an earlier tradition that was somehow, you know, in some ways lost. Um, so my point is, you know, dogma cannot be reformed. Well, you can't change dogma. But there's a lot of teaching that's not quite dogma, like social teaching of the church. You know, um, there's these, some of these issues uh, on capital punishment, you know, uh, on just war theory. Um, so here, it's, a, it's important teaching, but it's not a matter of dogma. We're not talking about the church, you know, publicly professing dogmatically anything wrong. We're talking about losing something of the tradition um, and that's regained later and, and made much more explicit and clear. Okay, so sometimes we just have to understand that this, is, this has happened. Now, the traditionalists who hate Vatican II, they can't deal with this. So they think that the church's teaching on religious liberty is uncatholic because it breaks with statements of 19th century popes who opposed movements towards religious liberty in Europe at that time. Those advocating religious liberty happen to be oftentimes violent, anti-clerical, uh, atheists. So you have to look at that context, but people who oppose Vatican II don't. And this, this is the, the uh, take a look at the Society of Pius X. They are against religious liberty. Why? Because they say that the church can't develop doctrine in this sort of a fashion and change what was taught in, you know, uh, not, not in the highest authority, it wasn't defined as dogma, but what was taught or assumed by Pius IX, you know, um, and also ecumenism, you know, uh, Pius XI uh, critiques this very seriously, the, the budding ecumenical movement in 1928. And so the teaching of Vatican II on ecumenism seems to be different than that. And so many of those who oppose Vatican II, they say, we, we're sticking with Pius XI. Vatican II is uncatholic. It has departed from tradition. Now, who is authorized to say what is authentic development of doctrine? Who is authorized to say what is, in fact, legitimate interpretation of tradition? Who is to determine what is changeable and what is not? And the answer is the magisterium. That's next class. But anyway, I just wanted to point out this idea of the development of doctrine here and the fact that there is sometimes a little bit of messier development of doctrine. All right, heresy and orthodoxy. Catholic theological tradition, we went through this a whole lot, but let me just say this here in case you didn't take, you didn't take that course or uh, you've forgotten what you learned there. Um, there are two kinds of heresy. Heresy is a choice, a one-sided choice of one side of the mystery over the other. Uh, the mystery of Christ and the church tends to always appear in a paradoxical form. Christ is God, Christ is man. That's hard to, to, it's really hard for the human mind to hold both of those intentions. So there is a natural tendency to want to knock off one of those and relax the tension and make things easier, okay? And so there are many who have so emphasized the divinity of Christ that they have really denied his humanity. And others have gone the other extreme, okay? So the same thing with the Trinity. God is one, God is three. That seems paradoxical. So lots of folks will try to relax the tension. Anyway, the point is lots of folks commit a certain heresy and they don't intend to deny the church's teaching. Sometimes the church hasn't defined the issue yet. Like Thomas Aquinas, he himself 
did not believe in the Immaculate Conception. Now, in his day, it was not a dogma. So he argued against it. And most of the Dominicans argued against it. The Franciscans were the ones who argued for it, the Franciscan theologians typically. So they're very proud that they won the battle <laughs> that got defined as a dogma. But St. Thomas Aquinas, this was a legitimate, open academic question in the time of Thomas. So he is not a formal heretic. Formal heretic is someone who deliberately, obstinately bucks the teaching of the church, the authoritative teaching of the church. Okay, a material, a material heresy is when somebody uh, innocently and honestly trying to follow the truth falls into an error that either is not condemned yet, or you just don't know the teaching of the church. You're not a theologian or historian, okay? So a lot of us have held on to material heresies. As you study theology, you'll find out some of your ideas were material heresies, okay? Um, but you have to keep in mind there's a big difference between material and formal heresy. Formal heresy is culpable, and it's, it's a serious, serious crime because it breaks the unity of the church. Uh, it, it proceeds from pride and arrogance. All right, so we just need to keep uh, this in mind. But even material heresy is still one-sided choice. It's still unbalanced. It still denies some side of the mystery, okay? The final thing I do want to talk about, this really is the final thing in this lecture, is the process of handing on the tradition. Very, very important. Who hands it on? And the answer is all of us. The whole church hands on the tradition. The tradition is entrusted to the church, the whole body of Christ. It's a common effort of the whole people of God, says Dei Pervum 10. That's very important. So it's not just clergy, it's not just the popes, not just the bishops, it's the whole people of God. There's an indispensable role of the family. If we understand tradition aright, we have to understand that the family, religious community, a Catholic school, have tremendous value. If the tradition is not just a matter of explicit teachings, ideas, writings, then if it includes the, the whole tacit dimension, the implicit dimension that you pick up, like you pick up language, how, where do you pick up language? The easiest, living in your family, because you're living with people who are speaking that language. That's where you learn your language. That's where you learn uh, usually all the tacit stuff, uh, it, your family. Not only learn your language, but if you live in a state like Texas or where I came from in Rhode Island, you have an accent. <laughs> the accent you picked up from your family and from your friends and the people that you live with. The more you live with somebody, the longer time you have with them, the more you can absorb this tacit dimension from them, the implicit. And that's why you can't replace what goes on in the family. This is why parents are the primary religious educators because religious education isn't just a once a week thing. God bless our professional religious educators. God bless theologians like me who teach classes. But these classes can't convey the whole tradition. The liturgy conveys it and life lived in the family. And when you join a religious community, that's like a religious family. You're living with people. You know, this is why not a year in a novitiate is important. You know, you're not just coming to class, you're living in the, the monastery or the convent, whatever it is, and you can pick up the tradition that's been passed on in that convent, in that religious community, going back to the founder, okay? Catholic school, if the teachers are just teaching cerebrally doctrine, if they're not teaching discipleship and not modeling discipleship, we're losing the value of Catholic school. But if they're modeling discipleship, then kids in that environment are going to pick up a lot of the Catholic tradition in the school. So that's why, you know, school, you're in school. After home, you're in school the most as a child. You know, for many years, you're in school more hours than you are with your parents at home. So th this is the point. If we understand tradition correctly, we've got to understand how to pass it on and the value of the domestic church. The domestic church is the smallest unit of the church, not the parish. And so we need to understand the incredibly important role of all the adults in the family passing on the tradition to the kids, okay? So the incredible thing is that this is the whole job of the whole church to pass on the tradition. However, apostolic succession of our bishops helps ensure that tradition is in continuity with the tradition going back to the apostles, that we don't break free of the mooring and start going off like the modernists would have us do, the radical ones, into just doing a new thing and a different thing, okay? We've got a, there needs to be 
growth and progress, but it's got to be always in continuity with the tradition. It needs to be the unfolding of the faith once and for all delivered to the saints, not the changing or departure from that faith. And what guarantees that? The orderly succession of teachers. It's a human process. It's a supernatural process because of the anointing that the apostles gave to the first bishops and they gave to their successors all the way down to ours. The laying on of hands imparts to bishops a charism of truth. Now we're going to talk a lot more about that next class when we talk about the magisterium.